All right, let's start by, by asking the first question. Um, <laughs> um, let's just start by, if we're gonna talk about dog behavior, I wanna start with talking about who dogs are. You would think we would know the answer to that question and it would be simple and it would be settled and of course we could spend all day talking about just that topic because it's not. It's not settled, it's controversial, but, but the details of that controversy um, are really interesting and informative. But we, really, we have no records, there's no way of knowing how this domestication process first started. The most current and I think a very credible hypothesis, hypothesis is from um, the Coppingers in their book Dogs, brilliantly named Dogs, that came out in 2002, which was, which was a, a different perspective. Rather, rather than arguing that we domesticated dogs and it's something we imposed onto dogs or wolves and then created domesticated dogs from it, what the Coppingers argued was that there was natural selection, that, that wolves who were a little bit less shy, a little bit less flighty, and keep that in mind, by the way, because this whole shy, flighty uh, trait is going to flow through a tremendous amount of what we talk about today, by the way. So just sort of people, people get that certain aspects of behavior are heritable when it comes to breed-related activities. They know retrievers in general like to retrieve. They get that. But, but it's truly not common knowledge that other behaviors are highly heritable. Um, on temperament, which influences personality. Um, basically, here's what comes out loud and clear. If you look at all the literature, and I have piles and piles of it in my office, here's what just comes screaming out at you. This whole, the trait related to being shy or neophobic or afraid of new things um, versus bold, happy to investigate new things, comes out in all the literature in a range of mammalian species, from humans to primates to dogs. It's huge. It's really, really important. The, the this divisions that you see on your screen, fearfulness can be divided into those three things. Those are with humans. I highlighted in red the things that we can determine in dogs. Social reticence, distress about events in the external world. And the, notice that those are separate. So one of the things I've found, how many have you seen dogs who are shy or neophobic or fearful of unfamiliar people, but not an, but not an environmental change, or dogs who are afraid of novel environments, novel objects, but not people, right? They sort, they seem to sort somewhat separately. Certainly there are a lot of dogs who are both, but they seem to sort somewhat separately. One of the things that's important in terms of genetics and breeding, and the reason I'm making a big point of this, is that we need to do a better job breeding dogs. And so I see reactivity as a trait that sorts separately from whether a dog is, for example, where it is on the shy bull continuum. I think it sorts separately. You, this is not something you see in the work on personality or temperaments. However, Scott and Fuller talked about it. What? 40 years ago, Scott and Fuller actually rated different dogs as being more or less reactive. Interestingly, they found that Shelties were less reactive than Basenjis, Beagles, and Terriers. Would you put Shelties in 2011 in that category? I would put them probably at the highest in terms of reactivity to environmental stimuli, um, which tells you something about how quickly we can have an effect on genetics. Now, this isn't a study, we're just sort of giving anecdotal evidence, but nonetheless. So you got a litter of six puppies and one female. Females tend to be less aggressive if you let them go through two heats and then, and then spay them. We need a lot more research on this. Um, a lot more research. Just a quick comment about testosterone. Um, and, and I do want to say, by the way, it, it, testosterone is indeed linked with aggression. But there is a reason, as I said earlier, that bitch is a dirty word. Don't think estrogen is a benevolent hormone. <laughs> no, 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 no. That's, I don't want to for any sex biases going on here. Um, however, there is, there is a correlation between increased testosterone and increased aggression. And here's 
an interesting study that looked at agility competitors. And basically, they measured male agility competitors pre-competition and post-competition. And they found that if men had elevated high levels of testosterone, if they lost, then they had elevated levels of cortisol, and so did their dogs. And so did their dogs. And, and when you looked at their behavior, these were more likely to be the competitors who were gruff, harsh, or used some kind of positive punishment, positive not being happy good, right? Use positive punishment, gruff word, um, leash jerk, to their dogs. So that related to testosterone, and it related to losing, and it related to increased cortisol in the competitor, male, and the dog, okay? Um, so, critical period socialization, you all know of Scott and Fuller's work, that's the main lesson we got from Scott and Fuller, is the importance of socialization. Keep in mind, that they define the critical period of socialization as being three to seven weeks. That number, the top number, seven weeks, has been expanded, Scott and Fuller sort of expanded it, other people who went after them expanded it, and now we consider it to be like, well, it's squishier, it's like three to 12 weeks. Um, Okay, so that's data point one. Um, there's been very little research since Scott and Fuller on that. So there's no question that if you keep puppies locked in an enclosure and give them food through a, through a doorway like somebody in a bad prison movie, um, uh, they turn out to be less comfortable around people, especially on familiar ones. There's no question that that's true, okay? There's no question that's true. And... And basically, that process is a signal goes to the thalamus, but rather than being sent for processing, it goes straight to the limbic system. It goes straight, see that little arrow going straight down? It goes straight to the amygdala in the hippocampus, and it basically says, you better react right now, because I don't know if this is dangerous or not, but you don't have any time to think about it. I don't have time to analyze it. It takes time for this analysis. Not very long, but a tenth of a second, eight hundredths of a second, that can be the difference between being alive or dead. Right? So, so, have you ever been, I don't know, it's happened to everybody. Something happens, you're lying in bed and there's a noise, you're walking down the street and it's dark and you're alone and you hear a noise behind you and there's this flush of fear, right? You can feel it floods through your body, right? But you haven't even figured out what the sound is yet. That's this. There's something that happens in people that I think happens in dogs and it's called an overly active amygdala pathway. Throw that one out at, at breakfast to your friends. It's also called hyperarousal. Basically what we're talking about is that shortcut system can't turn off. So what you get are animals who are always, always hyperaroused. They always have a level of cortisol in their brain. Um, they have this incredible startle response. And I think, I think, this is exactly, that's exactly what you see in PTSD in humans, and I think that's exactly what we see in some of our dogs. I think dogs suffer from PTSD. They have all the equipment to suffer from it. They have all the behavior. Well, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the behaviors. Um, I'm not alone, by the way. Not a lot of people talking about this. Karen Overall basically says, of course they do. Um, Frank McMillan, who's at Best Friends, the big um, rescue shelter in Utah, he gave a talk not too long ago, basically saying most dogs who go through rescues have some version of PTSD. We need to understand it because you need to be thoughtful about treating it. Um, these.